Well, then I'll just leave the stage to Felix, and then it's a really, well, I'm Dutch, so I'm supposed to be able to pronounce this, but we don't get the dots and the O's, so Felix Gröbert. That's right, yeah. Right? Thank you. Yes. Good. Give him a big round of applause. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and thanks for coming to my talk. So um, this talk is about uh, automatic identification of crypto in software. And um, this work is um, the result of my master thesis, which I wrote in the um, beginning of this year. I submitted it to the University of Bochum, Germany. And since then, I've been working for Google in Zurich. So um, these slides are also online later uh, this day or maybe tomorrow. And uh, also the code and everything else will be published. You can actually find the uh, link to the code and uh, the thesis itself in the uh, Pentabarf, Pentabarf system, in the FAR plan. So you might have um, come across videos of movies you would, would like to watch and then there's a, a display where it says you need to download this code from XYZ and to install this coded codec, otherwise you won't be able to watch this movie. And you, after you uh, or a friend of yours installed that codec, he might come across something like this. So if you don't, uh, um, if you don't, uh, you don't get access to your files anymore suddenly. Everything is encrypted by this evil malware. Um, you won't get access to them without making of what we need, which is the saying of the malware authors, and they used the specially secure RSA 1024 uh, algorithm to encrypt your files. So um, this is my main motivation for doing this kind of work. Uh, I wanted to look at uh, malware or other kinds of software and try to find out how could I automatically find out which kind of crypto is used in that software product and also find out uh, what are the keys, how is it changed, is it only RSA with AES or, or is there also a hashing function and so on and so forth. So this is actually not a malware, but it's a subtype which is called ransomware. Ransomware is a malware which uh, wants you to send them money, and if you send, send them money, you get a cryptographic key and maybe also a tool to decrypt your documents, your, um, for example, PDFs and uh, text files. So this uh, malware is actually called GP Code. It uses AES in electronic codebook uh, cipher mode with a 256-bit uh, key and the strong algorithm RSA1025. Of course, there are other examples of malware, which are listed here, which use cryptography. Shadowbot uh, has its own implementation of MD5 and also uses XOR for obfuscation. Um, Configure uh, used uh, the OpenSSL SHA-1 and also a reference implementation of the um, MD6 submission to the uh, SHA-3 competition. Um, this uh, reference implementation of MD6, which is not yet out there, um, well, the implementation is out there, but it's not r really a standard for SHA-3, but this reference implementation actually had a buffer overflow. And the malware authors used that reference implementation in their malware. Sadly, you couldn't really exploit it to gain uh, command execution, but uh, they later fixed, they were aware of in, this flaw in, 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 the, in their reference implementation and later brought out a malware update to patch their config distributions. Um, Raildeck uh, uses a statically linked um, OpenSSL AES with a zero initialization vector. And uh, they had a key exchange protocol, which not only used always the same key, so you speak with your server, negotiate a key, um, but the server always chose the uh, same key. There was no random choice by the server. It was always the same key, so that was, on that point, was flawed, 
but also the uh, key exchange happened over an unauthenticated SSL-like uh, channel where the well the client did not really check the server certificate, so you could also man in the middle it. Um, Maproot actually had a very interesting file still network of 58 rounds. Um, and it first looked like they use a really large key, something over 64 bits or something like that. But it turned out that they, their key scheduling in the Feistel network for encryption was only effectively 32 bit. So, and uh, therefore you could brute force the 32 bits and then find out the key, or the, the, the uh, key and the contents of the packets. And they also um, implemented uh, SHA-1, SHA but for SHA-1 you have uh, special constants, which are your initialization constants. And uh, they are quite significant for SHA-1 and also well chosen for SHA-1. But um, what they did, they used uh, SHA-1 implementation, but only changed the um, initialization vectors. So if you were a malware analyst and were to compute a SHA-1 over their packets, for example, you would get a different SHA-1 sum because they used uh, di different EVs, IVs, in initialization vectors. Agobot uh, used plain old IRC over SSL. Sometimes that works too. Um, Storm had the very secure authentication of 56-bit RSA, which is not long enough. Uh, more recently, in Nugash, they used um, also quite strong crypto, and they, for the first time, had a design which was somewhat promising. So my motivation was to look at these kinds of malware and decide how could I help um, an analyst to find the crypto which is used by a malware or by something different, like a DRM system or anything else which uses crypto? And my second motivation came from the system verification perspective. Um, if you go back, in, and it's always good to cite, a, uh, to cite someone um, very past in a master thesis, so I went back to the 18th century and cited Kerkhoff, who um, back then proposed that a crypto system should be secure even if any, everything about the system except the key is public knowledge, which is widely accepted by cryptographers today, public cryptographers, of course, um, that the uh, design of the crypto primitive should be public and uh, should be analyzable, and this is all the open source um, thinking. Shannon later on uh, summarizes it as the enemy knows the system. And Raymond, uh, Eric S. Raymond uh, in 2004 um, was uh, writing about the incident with Cisco where he wasn't really uh, tr trusting Cisco because he doesn't have access to their source code and therefore he postulated that uh, any software, security software design that doesn't assume the enemy possesses the source code is already untrustworthy. And I would say you can really extend that because you don't really, really need to access to the source code, but rather you can also reverse engineer the source code. So every design which doesn't assume that you have the source code or you are able to reverse the source code is already flawed. So in the security evaluation, um, one has to uh, find out whether the system is secure, whether it's a secure cryptographic design, and therefore, you have to find out as an analyst um, what kind of crypto is used, where is it used, when is it triggered, where is it located in memory, and so on. And this is, of course, difficult if the uh, source code or design plans and code uh, is not public, which is the case in like the malware examples I gave before, and also the case with digital rights management systems or any other um, binary you have. So my proposed um, solution is to do a two-phase approach. First, you run your target binary, generate a trace file which contains instructions and memory, and then later on analyze this trace file and generate a report what kind of crypto has been used. In the thesis I um, uh, wrote down this, this uh, thesis um, that if 
if a standardized cryptographic primitive with its input and output is present in an execution trace, an algorithm exists to identify and verify the instance of the primitive, including its parameters, which is kind of important because you do not only want to know whether it's IES or uh, DES which is used, but also you want to know the parameters which are used, for example, the plain text, the ciphertext, the key, because you really are interested in the payload the malware is sending, for example. And I also, of course, did some constraints, some assumptions for the uh, thesis because I didn't want to, the work to spread out too far. So I uh, assumed that the, uh, for the thesis, I assumed that the code is not self-modifying or obfuscated. I did some tests with one stage packers and I'm going to talk about this later, but um, I did this assumption to have a baseline to build upon. Also, I did not uh, take a look at interpreted code or just-in-time compiled code. And um, I'm only limiting this to cryptographic primitives, not general functionality of software, which would be insane. Um, I also don't, do not detect the mode of operation, whether it's electronic codebook or uh, CBC mode. Or, um, and I also don't take a look at compression or padding. So, um, I defined some kind of moving targets uh, for Windows 32 and x86, which are these here, you see over here. Um, these are moving targets because you have an original definition of, uh, of the uh, cryptographic primitive in the original paper, but then you have errata, which is later on compiled and uh, written by the scientific community and uh, they say you shouldn't use that key or you should watch out for, for this uh, implementation specific attacks. Then you have optimization on the source code level, um, which gets us to the final implementation, which is then again optimized depending on compiler and compiler options to the final um, x86 compiled code. So, I took uh, four different uh, libraries, open source libraries of uh, cryptographic code, bcrypt, CryptoPP, um, Gladman's uh, AES implementation, and OpenSSL. Um, I can link them differently, um, use different compiler on, uh, on Windows, and use them in different mode of operations. And then I did my related work research for, for this topic and started with the uh, most common way one would start is to look at reverse engineering forums and see what, what are the bad guys using, what are, what are reversers using, um, what is already out there. So here you see on the uh, table in the top left, um, three, uh, six different um, uh, reversing uh, tools to find cryptography in static binaries, that means that you first have to unpack your packed malware, for example, and then run this uh, tool on the binary. They are for different platforms. One, one uh, crypto analyzer, this comes with uh, PEID, which is a tool to fingerprint uh, packers. The FineCrypt plugin uh, is um, by the IDA Pro authors, and one plugin for OliDBG. Furthermore, there are three standalone tools. In the table below, you see uh, their, their uh, performance. Uh, plus means that the algorithm was found by the tool. Minus means it was not found. And the number next to it means the number of false positives. Um, of course, um, none of the tools detect dynamically linked or dynamically generated code which is, of course, an advantage I have to mention when I'm using dynamic instrumentation to, to look at my code, which is an advantage these static tools don't have. Um, they are mostly working using byte-oriented signatures uh, and look for constants in memory or in the unpacked binary. Um, the evaluation shows that all detect MD5 because MD5 is quite significant to its constants. Um, none of the tools detects RSA and uh, RC4 is only detected one, uh, once. Because RC4 
has a very algorithmic approach and doesn't have really uh, lookup tables or constants which could be used to uh, fingerprint it. In the research community, there are uh, three significant papers. One is by, um, by Wang and uh, co-authors. They did a proof of concept with Agobot, which I mentioned earlier, which uses um, IRC over SSL. What they do is they um, look at uh, tainted data and um, follow it through the application executions. All these three um, approaches are using dynamic instrumentation or some other sort of dynamically introspecting into the malware. And uh, one, they, they uh, watch the execution code flow and um, specifically look for um, bitwise instructions. For example, XOR and rotate left. And then they um, compute a cumulative bitwise instruction percentage, which first goes up. And at the turning point between the decryption and the, the, the encryption phase and the finally decrypted phase, at the turning point, the um, cumulative bitwise instruction percentage goes down because uh, in cryptographic, cryptographic uh, routines often have a high percentage of bitwise instructions. Therefore, after the um, ciphertext has been uh, decrypted, the, um, the uh, amount of bitwise instruction decreases. Um, Caballero, they, uh, they took their finding and uh, said, okay, what happens if you have multiple encryptions and decryptions in your program, then this cumulative percentage uh, doesn't work so well because you have it going up and down and cannot really figure out which are the turning points where you can, at the turning point, where you can actually do a memory dump and then get your, get your plain text which you want. So they said, uh, we only look at, um, at um, encrypted block processing and they used a blockwise or functionwise bitwise instruction percentage and um, didn't really count up, count up the percentage of bitwise instructions. Um, Noel Lux, he, uh, he took a completely different approach. He um, also used uh, taint track, uh, tainting of data, which comes in over the network and followed that data to uh, find loops over that data. And then he uh, looked, how does this loop manipulate the data? Is there a decrease or increase of information entropy after the uh, data has been decrypted? If so, he uh, said that if that's the case, uh, there has been a decrypted packet. Because if you look at ciphertext, it's, it's, uh, it differs vastly in, in information entropy from a plain text. So, um, and he also used loop detection to find these loops, and then um, also used um, wall grinds um, tainting to follow the data through the loops. Further approaches um, were quite early in the, in the 90s by um, Shamir and Janssen. They um, wanted to find RSA um, private keys in, in software because back then often software still had private keys embedded into the, uh, into the memory, for example. And they found a method to um, exploit the characteristics of the um, RSA system, which has the uh, NPQ um, characteristic, and then were able to find these large numbers in memory and were able to, to find the private key for, for an RSA encryption system. More recently, um, Haldaman wrote a paper called Code Boot Attacks, which was also quite well covered in the press, where they used um, these laptops. Uh, for example, you have a stolen laptop, want to get the uh, hardware encryption, uh, the disk encryption key, then uh, opened up the tray where you can get access to the uh, memory of the laptop, froze the memory, and then took it out. But um, then you have to dig through four gigabytes of memory to find the key, right? You, you have the uh, memory of the uh, computer you want to analyze, but have to find the, RS, the uh, AES key for the hard disk encryption in memory. <coughs> 
So what they did is um, they exploited the character characteristic of AES uh, round keys. AES round keys um, often have, uh, they, they are um, pre-computed in memory often. So you have a 128 um, block sitting next to a 128 bo block and then can you can compute the um, the next round for this block and compare them and then thereby find the um, AS key in memory. <coughs> um, Stevens and Baldwin, they um, used, um, they tried to find a, a shell code in PDFs by um, looking at certain strings in the PDF and trying to find uh, XOR pads which later on uh, are XORed up to a shell code lying in that uh, document. So as, said, as I said before, um, our approach is to, to first do a, binanic, a dynamic binary instrumentation and then later on do the analysis. First I will talk about the dynamic binary instrumentation. Um, we use PIN for the, um, as, a, as a baseline tool for the dynamic instrumentation and wrote a PIN tool to instrument the target binary using PIN. PIN is a free of charge tool provided by Intel and uh, you can use it for example for um, performance tests and uh, but also to uh, monitor self-modifying code. Um, the PIN tool we wrote is, uh, can be filtered by a DLL name or a thread ID. You can start after a specific number of instructions in order to skip an unpacker, for example. Um, it records a compressed trace where the debug information is compressed in the form that you don't have to, for each, for each instruction, you don't have the, um, the uh, actual function address, uh, function name or DLL name. And um, of course, the dynamic approach has the constraint that the code must be executed. If the malware doesn't start executing the, um, the crypto routines we, which we want to monitor, there is no chance, in, chance for, for getting there and being able to monitor it. And an um, advantage of the, the dynamic instrumentation is, of course, that you are able to monitor, for example, indirect branches, or um, are able to monitor um, what kind of data is actually worked upon. The um, trace file looks like this. Um, you have a, a line, for example, for memory access, where you can see a read of 32 bits at a specific address and the value I actually read. And you have lines for instruction addresses with a compressed um, library name compressed function name and offset to the function thread ID and uh, disassembly and change registered. So if you collect the uh, trace file, you can later on put this trace file um, into the analysis phase. Um, I did take this approach of the two phase um, because uh, I wanted to have the tracing framework interchangeable. So I would be later on able to exchange the PIN framework for another framework like Wallgrind or Bitblaze because the framework is highly dependent on performance and uh, also sometimes you cannot really trace a malware under this framework so you have to take a different framework and the trace file um, acts as an independent layer here. If we go to the analysis phase um, I, I first pass the uh, trace file, filter again by, uh, for example, thread or um, function name or DLL, and um, then queue uh, the instructions up to later analyze them. The queue, with the queue you can also work with an interactive console based on IPython, and um, you can, uh, for example, do some debugging tests there. And uh, You can also export the structure um, with structure, I mean, for example, basic blocks or control flow graph and export it to PDF, which looks like this. On the right, you see a control flow graph of the exo testing application, um, which was exported using GraphVis. To generate the executed basic blocks, 
I do a two pass over the sequential um, instructions. First, I determine jump points, where is it jumped into, and where is it jumped out, and then during the second pass, I do a, um, the population of the data structure. Um, the control for graph is then um, just compiled from the sequentially executed um, basic blocks, and the advantage, again, of dynamic instrumentation here is that you not only um, get the indirect branches, but also are able to see um, how much is the uh, edge being taken. For example, you see here, this edge is taken 250, uh, 252 times, and this is taken two times, for example. And based on that, I can do a loop detection, which is um, which I adopted from Tubella's algorithm. Um, this loop detection algorithm um, works by detecting multiple executions of the same address and um, exposed several features. There is also the langauer Atarian algorithm, but this one doesn't show you how much, how many times is an is an loop actually executed, how many iterations that does it have, and how are the loops nested, which is quite interesting from, from the analysis perspective. So here's an example of the loop detection algorithm. Um, on the top left, you see the, the target code, which um, should be uh, detected. And um, the loop detection works by using a an, an loop stack. Um, again, if, if uh, an instruction has been executed multiple times, the um, iteration is incremented on the loop stack, which you see right here. Here is the first, first assignment to C, and here's the second. So C will be, uh, because this is an address we already seen before, without branching out of the um, yellow, yellow uh, part of the uh, loop, the um, loop stack is incremented here. Because there, there we enter an uh, additional basic block, in the red one. We add another layer on the loop stack, which is the red layer. Also for, um, not only for branches, but also for calls and returns, uh, the loop stack is uh, incremented with another layer and again counted. So the result of uh, this example is that the outer yellow loop is executed two times um, and the inner, inner red loops are um, iterated once and twice and then again each call uh, the blue, blue basic block for, for one iteration. Um, besides the loop detection and basic block generation, we want, uh, also want to uh, detect uh, values in memory. To do that, um, we use a memory construction algorithm, which uses, um, which is needed because you have uh, usually cryptographic values are larger than the register size in, in modern CPUs, so you have to find out where are the keys located. So um, for, um, for the trace, we walk down the trace and then do a recursive search to check whether at the next address lying in memory, whether there's another, another access to that memory address. For example, if we check the um, address zero and then we are at the address zero at this access of memory, uh, we check whether at the next address, namely uh, last address plus length, whether there's another access to memory, this one here. And then we uh, compile this to the, um, to the next block. For example, for a candidate for a key. Um, we continue our, our church um, for, for each of the next addresses, but also split it up if there are multiple, multiple uh, references to memory. For example, here you have uh, multiple accesses, 
at this address there is an access to this value, but also to uh, this value. So we associate these two values because they are both, for example, a read of the same length and are also reference in the same uh, address space. So, for example, this blue here, this blue one, this is referenced from um, from an uh, address which is not nearby the address of this one or these two here, so it doesn't get associated with these values in memory. The last phase of our analysis is to find the uh, actual crypto based upon our uh, restructuring of the code. And to do this, we uh, exploit several ident um, identif identification observations um, with cryptographic code. As I mentioned earlier, cryptographic code makes excessive use of bitwise arithmetic instructions. On the right, you see uh, an example from the OpenSSL DES, which uh, uses, for, if you see in the middle, if you look in the middle, you see a lot of uh, instructions which are bitwise. And um, you can exploit that characteristic as shown by Caballero and Wang to find cryptographic code. And uh, for example, Caballero also found out if you compare the bitwise arithmetic uh, instruction set with uh, BMP, So um, another identification we made is um, that the constant and sequences of mnemonics um, indicate the type of cryptographic algorithm. You see on the bottom here um, different instructions, uh, different implementations of MD5, but um, they all start with a rotate left 7. And their next instructions are also the same, so you could, to find an MD5 implementation, you could use uh, the chain of instructions, rotate left, add, move, XOR, which is all the same for all three implementations. Further identifications observations we um, made is that, uh, like Noe Lutz noted, cryptographic code contains loops. However, um, often in implementations, loop unrolling is used to make the code more um, effective to optimize it. But uh, so you, you cannot really say if uh, there's a loop of 16 rounds, it must be in uh, DES implementation, because DES uses 16 rounds, but you're, you're, um, you, you uh, cannot really tell from that, but you can use it as a further identi uh, indicator to uh, pinpoint the cryptographic code. And the last identification we um, made is also the most significant identification method. Um, is that an uh, input-output relation to, grip, to, the, uh, to the cryptographic code mo most often has a predefined, verifi verifiable relation. So you have something which you put into your AES, but um, the output for the same key and same input is always is the same. So you can exploit this relation, which is predefined, and um, if you know the algorithm, you can use the reference implementation to actually verify this instance of an AES encryption in code. There are some um, uh, cryptographic primitives which don't have this deterministic relation, but um, we don't um, look at these for now. So I've implemented several identification methods. Um, a most naive uh, uh, identification method using signatures on uh, debug symbols of um, common APIs. Um, then I used several constants, which were also used by the reverse engineering tools, and tried to find the constants in memory. I uh, implemented a method to find the sequence of mnemonics, like see in the MD5 example, to find um, the uh, reoccurring sequence of, uh, of a certain computation. Um, I'm going to talk about the memory constant tuple um, identification method later. I 
implemented the related work methods and also more generic um, identification methods I'm going to talk about now. The uh, method, um, the Menonic uh, constant method, um, defines, this, defines uh, for each implementation, defines a set of bitwise uh, instructions which have also a static constant, for example, rotate left 14 hex. And then for each algorithm, uh, a unique set is built. For example, here, the dotted intersection MD5 set, which uh, is composed of the OpenSSL, of the intersection of the OpenSSL MD5 and Bcrypt MD5 and CryptoPP MD5. So this is one uh, set which can be used to identify MD5, but there's a further set which is a unique MD5 set, which is the subtraction of other um, implementations. For example, if you subtract the OpenSSL RC4 um, implementation out of the intersection set, you get the unique set. Um, the unique set has, of course, a, a stronger relation to the algorithm, but is of also smaller. If you use that to, um, to identify the type of algorithm, um, you um, get this table. Um, in order to further visualize this table, I used a tool to associate the x-axis and y-axis of the table around a circle. And here you see the, um, which algorithm found, which signature want, found which algorithm. So here you see the bcrypt AES signature. And this, this signature matches only the bcrypt AES code with a cell value over 70. The um, MD5 crypto PP signature finds, the, uh, finds MD5 CryptoPP MD5, but also with a smaller value, some false positives. The unique signatures work better, of course, but they also have, for example, for AES, no unique set. Um, there are zero false positives for the RSA unique signature and zero false positives for the DES and MD5 signature, which each map to the CryptoPP MD5, Bcrypt MD5, and OpenSSL MD5 signatures. Um, RC4, um, as I said before, has a very algorithmic um, implement structure, and therefore um, it doesn't have a very large set of unique um, tuples. So there are much, uh, a much higher uh, number of false positives for the RC4 unique signature. One uh, generic method I implemented was the loop differ. Um, you can think of a loop as a three-dimensional three cube where each axis has a number of executions, inst uh, instructions, and iterations. So, for example, here in the uh, green axis, you have the uh, instructions. Down there, uh, executions and iterations. And for each point in the, uh, in the cube, you can compare this block to the next iteration or this block to the next execution of the loop. And um, I tested the relation between these values, for example, for XOR relations and uh, for counter, whether there's counter incrementing between these iterations or executions. The best uh, generic me method we found was the data verifier method. They, uh, there um, we used uh, first filtered for candidates for, uh, crypt for cipher text and keys. Um, for example, we filtered out certain length of um, memory values we found in, in memory and uh, also sliced those values in order to fit nicely for a candidate for, for a key here. Then uh, we, we uh, for example, we said that there might be some AES code in, in that part of the trace. And then we, we try to find candidate values for the key in plain text, um, give these values to a AES reference implementation, get a ciphertext out. And if we actually find the ciphertext, we, which we get from our reference implementation, if you find it in the, um, in the trace file, for example, here's a, 
128 right. Um, if this is equal, we actually detect an AES not only with um, the key, but also with the plaintext and ciphertext and verified its relation. The um, general performance of the tool is okay for a prototype. The trace files are between 10 and 90 megabytes and the um, tracing times and analysis times are between uh, several minutes and several hours. Our um, real-world uh, experiment, experiments we did um, were th that we packed an XOR application, which does, do, does a simple XOR, packed it with SPAC, a common packer, um, and this increased, of course, the trace file by a factor of 17. However, after it has been unpacked, the analysis routines were still able to find the uh, core loops of the uh, XOR encryption and were able to uh, find the XOR key and XOR plaintext. We also tested an, um, the curl command line tool to initiate a HTTPS session with a pre-configured um, AS256. And OpenSSL, of course, a curl uses OpenSSL. And this trace took uh, seven minutes and 45 megabytes and the analysis found um, the um, plain text, key, and cipher text of 94% uh, of all SSL blocks. Coming back to the malware now, um, the GP code malware was also um, run through the, our um, prototype implementation. And uh, what you see here is the um, AES key, which was used to encrypt the files, um, encrypted with the um, public key of the malware author. And while running it through our analysis tool, we uh, found that for each file, it does not com completely encrypt it, but rather only encrypts the first, first blocks. So this is the original file. And down here, you see the modified file by GP code. And it only encrypts these blocks here. And it uses ECB mode and also a static key for every file. Also a pencil signature down here. And while running it through our analysis tool, we found um, using our reference implementation method, we found uh, this instant, which was used for this file right here. And here you can see the encrypted ciphertext EA0B, which was later on used to um, corrupt the file. So further work I want to do in that area is um, to implement a, this relation checker with the reference implementation and a dedicated pin tool and uh, do a, maybe a proof of concept with Skype uh, or something else. Um, also, pin does not really work quite well for malware, so there might be a good option to um, switch from pin to another tracing tool or tracing format like BitBlaze provides. Also, there's uh, some open work to be done in the um, right now more naive uh, signatures. They could be done better using method machine learning methods. And um, my kind of my vision for this project is to have a tool to actually uh, run through, run a binary through this tool and later on get the complete definition of a cryptographic protocol. It would be nice to have a tool to trace a file, but then not only get in each instance of all these uh, cryptographic primitives, but also be able to chain these cryptographic primitives together and get a definition of cryptographic protocol from the binary. The source code is available here. So um, to, sum, so to summarize, um, if you use a static key, you have failed before, but now you fail more faster. Because in my opinion, like I showed, the automatic identification of crypto code is feasible and gets better. Um, the applications of the proposed methods include um, malware, DRM systems, closed source, obfuscated software, and my guess is that is so that it will find interesting results. Um, further work, of course, has to be done with machine learning and uh, further work, of course, in the dynamic binary instrumentation systems. 
So thanks for your attention and I'm open to questions now. Wow. Wow, wow. Okay, I am flabbergasted. Anyone in here? Do you have questions? Would you please come up front? Just, just come, come and stand next to me and we can have fun asking questions. Yeah. Uh, one question, one remark. Uh, has no one ever tried elliptic curve uh, crypto? Because it's more complicated in structure. Um, that's very true that it's more complicated and would be more complicated to detect, but I'm not aware of any uh, attempts to detect it. And then uh, one remark or one, one thesis, I would say that any protected implementation against side channels is not vulnerable to any of these attacks because then you have these uh, randomized execution paths. Well, that's very true, for example, for blinded RSA, but um, it also depends on what your kind of introspection you have for the smart card system. So for a smart card, it may be true, but if you have an x86 code which is running on your normal computer, you can normally inspect that code by tracing it, and if you're able to trace the code, you should be able to detect it. S-boxes, for example. In AES. That's right, yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm. Okay, could, could dumb people like me use this? Um, <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. Do you fear uh, your work might be abused for enforcing import or export restrictions? Can you say that again? Could you, do you fear your work could be abused to detect um, then export attempt or an import attempt on forbidden software, cryptographic software. Sorry, can you please again uh, repeat the question? Guys in the back who are leaving, could you please do it more like quietly so we can understand what they are talking about? It's already hard for me to understand, so if you be quiet, thank you. Um, could uh, this um, program you then um, be used or abused um, for detecting automatically a software that is transferred from a state that um, uh, from a country that yeah. prohibits export of soft such software? Yeah, that's that's true. Although I am not aware whether it's still enforced for the U.S. I think you're referee, referring to the U.S. here. Um, I, I'm not sure whether it's still enforced in France or the U.S. So, but I, I'm sure that can, could be used for that purpose. Um, hi. Uh, I would like to know if I want to use crypto on an embedded system and I can't or don't want to protect the key by uh, some hardware measure, uh, what would be, uh, in your opinion, the best way to uh, protect this uh, key or um, crypto algo? Um, in an embedded system? Yeah. Well, um, I cannot really answer this question because I'm not very into reversing embedded systems. But from a... Uh, or in general in any uh, um, computer microprocessor environment. Um, so one thing which was also already mentioned is that you could use uh, some randomness to the algorithm. Uh, you also, of course, with an embedded system, you might also take care that the memory is not uh, written to main memory, but maybe stays in in, L, in, in a cache, CPU cache, somewhere where uh, the cold boot attacks, which were described by Hallerman, wouldn't be applicable. So um, that would be another option. Otherwise, uh, I would recommend to design a secure uh, system and not use uh, snake oil crypto, but rather use a secure design for whatever you want to do. Okay, thank you. I want to um, roll out some embedded system um, where it's, it's from a design standpoint, not, not reasonable to 
have some hardware measure to protect the, the key um, I use. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I'll come back to you afterwards. Okay, thank you. I guess there are much more questions, aren't there? No questions at all? I, really? I don't believe you. So you are telling me you understood every word he said and you have no questions at all. There was no, I heard some yeses, but not all yeses. So that means we have really a lot of questions to handle. No, seriously, no questions? No? Wow, you smart people. I feel really dumber by the minute. And next to you, I feel even stupid. It's ridiculous. Well, I want to thank Felix so much for your presentation. Thank you. And I guess...